A Coloradan tells his country the extremists he used to hang out with were prepared for far worse on January 6th. I think we've gotten exceedingly lucky that more bloodshed did not happen because the potential has been there from the start. A key advisor to President Trump privately blamed him for the bloodshed. Nowadays, that man is advising Colorado's Republican candidate for governor, and he's bragging that he still works for Trump. Another pedestrian killed on Colfax. You know, the Band-Aids are helping a little bit, but we'll, I'm not sure they're gonna really solve the problem. And it's one thing to look at these amazing new photos with awe. This Coloradan looks at them with understanding. We're looking at such large distances, you can't help but feel small. Some perspective, some straight talk, a chance to get smarter together on Next. A Coloradan warned America today that the far-right extremists he used to run with were thirsty for a civil war on January 6, the day they stormed the Capitol shouting about hanging the vice president. Jason Van Tattenhove lives in Estes Park these days. He used to be a spokesperson for the militia group The Oath Keepers. He told congressional investigators that he's worried that right-wing militias are preparing for the next election. I, I think we need to quit mincing words and just talk about truths. And what it was going to be was an armed revolution. I mean, people died that day. Law enforcement officers died this day. There was a gallows set up in front of the Capitol. This could have been the spark that started a new civil war. Today's testimony also covered a meeting after the election where Trump attorney and conspiracy theorist Sidney Powell was pushing the fiction that Denver-based Dominion voting systems had been switching votes. It was that meeting, according to testimony, that spurred the president's public call for his supporters to assemble on January 6th, with Trump promising it will be wild. An advisor to a Colorado gubernatorial campaign also came up during today's January 6th committee hearing. Brad Parscale, the former Trump campaign manager. The committee revealed Parscale's text messages, saying that he believed the president's own rhetoric had led to that deadly violence and that he felt guilty for helping Trump win. Nowadays, Parscale is advising Republican candidate for governor Heidi Ganahl. And in campaign appearances for Ganahl, Parscale has been bragging that he still works for Trump, despite saying this to a colleague after the attempted coup. Mr. Parscale said, quote, this is about Trump pushing for uncertainty in our country, a sitting president asking for civil war. And then when he said, this week I feel guilty for helping him win, Katrina Pearson responded, you did what you felt right at the time and therefore it was right. Mr. Parscale added, yeah, but a woman is dead. And yeah, if I was Trump and I knew my rhetoric killed someone, when Ms. Pearson replied, it wasn't the rhetoric, Mr. Pascal said, Katrina, yes, it was. The Ganahl campaign has not responded to our repeated questions about Brad Parscale's role with her campaign. Parscale's publicly acknowledged being subpoenaed by the January 6th committee, as has yet another Ganahl advisor, Boris Epstein, who has admitted his role in trying to overthrow the 2020 election through alternate slates of electors. Campaign finance documents show, show that the Ganahl campaign has paid Parscale and Epstein's companies for communications and media work. And she praised them both following her primary win in an appearance on the podcast of Steve Bannon, who was also indicted for failing to cooperate with the January 6th investigation. I've got a great team, lots of folks helping us out, including Boris and Brad, and it's been, um, it's been quite an experience. Ganahl is connected with a fourth member of the Trump team currently being investigated over the insurrection at the Capitol. Ganahl, who is a CU regent, has declined to say if she disagrees with CU visiting scholar John Eastman, who attempted to overthrow American democracy by preparing a legal blueprint for the Trump team. I want to give you a heads up on a very visible fire that is burning southwest of Denver near Morrison. More smoke than anything else at this point. It's just about an acre or so burning south of Highway 285 near Mount Lindo. Smoke's pretty visible given its location in the foothills. Jeffco Sheriff's Office says no buildings are threatened at this point. They've gone door to door to tell a few folks nearby that they need to leave. There are about 60 homes that are currently on pre-evacuation. Colfax is a big part of Denver's identity. The famously nicknamed longest, wickedest street in America is wicked dangerous for people not in cars. 
Denver police are looking for another driver who hit and killed a pedestrian on Colfax. That was last night. Second hit and run death there in a week. Our Steve Steger looks at why Denver's signature street just cannot seem to get safer despite a whole lot of effort. It's not like Denver's transportation department is ignoring the danger on its trademark street. We are grateful for the changes they have made to Colfax. The city's invested quite a bit into making Colfax safer. They have done some quick and low cost treatments using paint and bollards to shrink the size of the road space and increase the size for pedestrians. Yet seven months into this year, drivers have hit at least seven pedestrians along Colfax in Denver, according to a review of DPD's Twitter account. Four of them didn't survive. They're designed like highways to move as many cars as fast as possible, and that's just inherently unsafe. Advocates like Jill Locantori with the Denver Streets Partnership have been railing against city streets designed like this for years. And that's sort of the way traffic engineering is built. Traffic engineers like CU Denver's Wes Marshall have been trying to figure out a way to change them. I think we've been trying to, you know, put band-aids on it over the years. Like when there is a crash at an intersection, we'll do something like the Harden Center line. The band-aids are helping a little bit. Our review of older data found pedestrian crashes along Colfax are down the last two years from a peak in 2019. I would start from scratch. I, I think it needs sort of a fundamental reinvention. Marshall says the street needs more than paint and posts to make significant safety improvements. I think I heard that about one third of trips on this road aren't in cars, so pedestrians, biking, transit, yet we dedicate about 90% of the space to cars. Like We could flip that and do something different. The city has a plan to narrow East Colfax and turn the center of it into bus rapid transit, a plan they've been talking about for years. But it's taking forever to implement those plans. And meanwhile, every week we're seeing the tweets from the police department about people being hit and seriously injured or killed. Marshall says the mindset of traffic engineers for so long has been to move as many cars as you can as fast as you can. He says it's, he's, that he's starting to see a mindset shift through prioritizing safety for everyone. Uh, the city told me today that pedestrian improvements on West Colfax go to construction next year. Still no timeline, though, on when that East Colfax bus rapid transit project starts. Mm -hmm. They're doing some engineering and design work, hoping to have a timeline on that soon. So you talk about that mindset shift. That makes a lot of sense, because I think instinctively we kind of say, like, oh, that pedestrian shouldn't have been jaywalking, or that driver was going too fast. And less often are we saying, well, is this street set up in a way to keep the pedestrian safe, keep the driver safe, that kind of thing. For the longest time, traffic engineers have based their 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 success yeah. on traffic design by millions of miles traveled versus crashes, right? So that means drive more, and if you have fewer crashes, then you're doing a good job. Yeah. In this case, a lot of engineers are starting to say, maybe we need to look at the roads and eliminate the ability for humans to make any sort of error. Mm. Just like... Take that all out of the picture, yeah. and then that'll create a better system. To the extent you can. Colfax is still just so tricky, but you keep talking about it, bringing it to our attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. You know, I'm old enough to remember when Aurora voters did not want Big Brother watching red lights. Now, granted, that was only back in 2018 when voters in Aurora soundly rejected red light cameras. But now, traffic enforcement by camera is coming to Aurora albeit in a different form. The city plans to put three speed radar vans in residential neighborhoods and near schools. Aurora police told council last night they think these vans should reduce speeding and crashes and cut down on street racing. So city council passed a pilot program. It was an 8-2 vote last night. The two were conservative council members Chris Gardner and Dustin Zvonik, who voted against it, saying they felt it was too similar to what voters just rejected four years ago. I fear that we will go down the road of using the revenue generated from this program to fund other needs in the city. We did the same thing with photo red light. We funded our nexus programs, um, gang reduction programs, other youth violence reduction programs. And when the voters decided to get rid of photo red light, that funding went away and we had no way to fund those programs. Um, law enforcement and public safety should not be used as revenue generation. The speed cameras in Aurora will go out next month. Warnings first, then fines, $40 in neighborhoods, $80 in school and work zones. The Democratic District Attorney down in the San Luis Valley is getting a babysitter, and he might get booted out of office altogether. 
Colorado's Democratic Attorney General says the DA failed to treat victims of crime with respect and dignity. So much so that AG Phil Weiser says Alonzo Payne of the 12th Judicial District violated the Victims Rights Act. Payne's been accused of yelling at crime victims and showing up late to meetings with them. The AG says that Payne and his office, they weren't consulting with victims when discussing plea deals or dismissing cases. It violated the law. It demands to be corrected. And although we can't go back in time and change how you're treated, we can change how other victims are treated going forward. Settlement in the case means that an outside monitor will come in to make sure that the DA's office is following the Victims' Rights Act. There will be more training for employees and more information for victims on their rights. If Payne's office doesn't cooperate with this, the state could end up taking cases and money away from the office. Payne's also facing a recall election. Secretary of State's office says it's received the signatures. Governor's office just told us they will set a date for the recall vote once the petition for the recall has been certified. More cities are making Coloradans pay for bags at the grocery store. Soon, no Coloradan will be spared. So where does the money go? New pictures reveal new mysteries of what lies far beyond our galaxy. It's just a constant reminder of how interesting space is. The NASA nerds in our backyard are going nuts for this stuff. That's next. A handful of cities now have 10 cent plastic bag fees. Boulder's is a decade old. Fort Collins is brand new. Denver's been at it for a year. Some of you have been asking us where that money is going, and that is a timely question because our Marshall Zellinger reminded us all of Colorado will be paying a bag fee come January. Denver started its 10 cent disposable bag fee last July. Lori emailed us wanting to know who gets the 10 cents. For every bag purchased, six cents goes back to the city. Four cents stays with the retailer. The retailer is supposed to use it on signs, disposable bag fee education for customers and staff, and to provide free bags. Richard emailed wanting to know, has the city spent its 60% share appropriately? We've spent um, what revenues we've collected so far on education. We had a bring your own bag campaign to let people know that it was coming, but also to continue to encourage people to use reusable bags. Winna McLaren with the city's Climate and Sustainability Office also said the city has handed out tens of thousands of reusable bags through city council offices and public events. We have had some um, challenges with delays and shortages and so our next shipment is due back actually in a couple weeks for more reusable bags. Uh, but we did go through I want to say 40,000 bags since this was implemented last summer. Richard also wanted to know how much the city has collected in bag fees. In the first year, the six cents per bag that the city gets added up to $1.6 million. That means 27 million bags were purchased, which is one quarter of what Denver's chief climate officer told me were being used before the fee. We know that Denverites use at least 100 million plastic bags at checkout every year. Live in a city that does not charge for bags? Start stocking up on reusable bags or dimes. A state law signed by the governor last year takes effect next year. Starting in January, cities must charge at least 10 cents for paper or plastic and ban most plastic starting in January 2024. Do bag fees change behavior? Boulder has had a 10 cent bag fee since 2013, and that's over here, 2013 to current. This shows a constant about four to four and a half million bags get bought each year in Boulder. Jamie Harkins with Boulder's Climate Initiatives Department told me it's probably stagnant because of a college student population with so much turnover and people just willing to pay for bags. She wonders, Kyle, if a higher bag fee would change behavior. We can look at Louisville for that because the city there just started a 25 cent bag fee on paper and plastic this past January. Bag fees change my behavior. I can, I can put 200 bucks worth of groceries into two 10 cent plastic bags and waddle like a duck out of the supermarket. Change the behavior yeah. of my nearby King Supers because they used to have the plastic bag barrel drop off uh -huh. right by the, the doorway. It is now behind customer service because people were coming in and taking the dropped off plastic ah. bags and using it as their free bags. <laughs> and the, the store doesn't want that. The, that barrel had like 100 bucks worth of bags in it. Yeah, it's like a bag bank. It's changing behavior, all right. Thanks, Marshall. 
Reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? Today was all about the heat. Temperatures soaring back into the 90s across the metro area, the eastern plains, 70s and 80s, up into the high country. And of course, we still are monitoring that fire in the far distance. You can still see some blue skies, though, across downtown Denver. Some storms, however, into northern Colorado, kicking out some really strong winds. Look at that 47 mile per hour wind gusts out toward DIA, as well as Watkins. These winds should start to simmer down just a bit as we look ahead toward the next hour or so. We'll zoom up into more. Morgan County, that's where we have a severe thunderstorm warning in place for uh, the next about 30 minutes or so. Some quarter size hail within this cell, a whole lot of lightning, incredibly heavy rains coming through and those strong winds too. back here in the metro area out toward DIA strong winds and just a little bit of light rain. Everything moves out by 11 tomorrow morning. We're back in business with the sunshine and then here comes the clouds. Storms will be hit or miss tomorrow afternoon as these temperatures once again skyrocket back to the upper 90s. We go here in Denver. It gets hotter Thursday and right now I have storms taking us into the weekend. He's kind of spacey, right down to where he lives. Shooting star. Pretty appropriate. A Coloradan whose expertise is outer space shows us what we can all learn from those stunning pictures coming back to Earth. Next. I'm not sure what those crisp new photos of the universe tell us, but they sure look pretty sweet. Thankfully, there are Coloradans a lot smarter about this stuff like Dr. James Dove, astronomy professor at MSU Denver. Shooting star, pretty appropriate. <laughs> All the streets in this neighborhood are named after wild flowers, so it's that kind of shooting star. But when we're looking at houses up here, we're like, ah, oh, that's the home of an astronomer. I'm James Dove. Uh, I work at uh, the Metropolitan State University of Denver. Um, I've been there for about 20 years, and I'm in the physics department. So the new James Webb images that finally got released, so they're one of the first formed galaxies, farthest galaxies away that we've ever observed with a telescope in the infrared. High school, I um, saw Halley's Comet, you know, that came around our, our neck of the woods, and uh, that got me hooked. One of the pictures that was released is an uh, image of a bunch of galaxies that are about 13 billion light years away. They're in the process of forming, so they're not complete yet. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was about 2.4 meters in diameter, and this telescope is about six and a half meters. You know, when you think about the light that we're looking in this image took 13 billion years to get to us. The light from the sun takes eight minutes, so. We're looking at such large distances, you can't help but feel small. I love teaching astronomy because it's a field that most people are interested in. <laughs> most people just have a natural fascination of what's up there. I sure hope this helps people appreciate what science does. Dr. Dove's perspective through the lens of our photojournalist Byron Reed. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope uses infrared imagery to capture those deepest and sharpest images of the universe we've ever seen. It's work that was decades in planning. Have a sign for you, not to mess with seasoned citizens. That and your feedback about speed radar cameras, next. It's a sign to respect your elders. Never fight with a dinosaur, says the sign at the Parker Senior Center. You'll get your ass kicked. That's I like that. That's good. That's one of the best ones in a while. Kelly Latito spotted this for us. If a sign is good enough that you take a picture, share it with us. We'll share it with the whole state. Email next at 9news.com. Craig writes in tonight with criticism for Aurora Council member Curtis Gardner, one of the conservatives on council who voted against speed radar cameras. He says, FL just wants to disagree and get publicity, which you gave him. You can disagree with him, but I don't think going after his motives is fair. He says he doesn't want law enforcement used for revenue generation. That's a principled position, like it or not.